This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. Well, there isn't all that much uh, anymore since the world's so transparent. Uh, but uh, one of the things I, I believe in, uh, and put it in the the book, what it takes is, is if you're going to do something, do, do something very consequential, uh, do something that's quite large, uh, if you can, that's unique. Uh, because if you operate in that kind of space, when you're successful, it's, it's a huge impact. Uh, the prospect of success enables you uh, to recruit people uh, who want to be part of that. And, and those type of large opportunities are pretty easily described. Uh, and and so uh, not everybody likes to operate uh, at scale. Some people like to do small things because it, uh, it is is meaningful for them emotionally. Uh, and and so occasionally you get a disagreement uh, on that. But those are life choices uh, r- rather than uh, commercial choices. Well, you do things that make you happy. It, it's not mandated. Uh, and everybody's different. Uh, and um, so some people, um, you know, if they have talent, like playing pro football, uh, you know, other people just like throwing the ball around, uh, you know, not even being on a team. Uh, what, what's better? Uh, d- depends what your objectives are, depends what your talent is, uh, you know, d- depends, um, you know, what, what, what gives you joy. <laughs> it makes it easier to succeed actually uh, because if you catch something for example that's cyclical that's it's a huge uh, opportunity then then you usually can find some place within that huge opportunity where you can make it work uh if 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 you're prosecuting a a really small thing and and you're wrong uh you don't have many places to go uh so you know, I've always found that uh, the easy place to be uh, and, you know, um, the ability where you can concentrate uh, human resources, get people excited about doing like really impactful big things. Uh, and you can afford to pay them, actually, because the bigger thing can generate much more in the way of... Uh, uh, of, of financial resources. So, so that brings people out of talent uh, to help you. Uh, and, and so altogether, it's a virtuous circle, uh, I think. Well, it's pattern recognition. And how do you get to pattern recognition? First, you need to understand the patterns and, and the changes that are happening. And, and that's... Uh, uh, that's either, uh, it's observational on some level. You, you can call it data, uh, or uh, you can just call it listening to uh, unusual things that people are saying that they haven't said before. And, you know, I've always um, tried to describe this. It's like seeing a piece of white lint on a, on a black dress. But most people disregard that piece of lint. They just see the dress. I always see the lint, uh, and and I'm I'm fascinated by how did something get someplace it's not supposed to be. So it doesn't even need to be a big discrepancy, but if something shouldn't be someplace, in 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 a, in a, in a constellation of facts that that you know sort of made sense in a traditional way, uh, I've learned that if you focus on why some one discordant note. Uh, is there, that's usually a key to something important. And if you can find two of those discordant notes, that's usually a straight line to someplace. And that someplace is not where you've been. And uh, usually when you figure out that things are changing or have changed, and you describe them, which you have to be able to do because it's not uh, some odd intuition, it's just focusing on facts. It's almost like a scientific discovery, if you will. When you describe it to other people in the real world, they tend to do absolutely nothing about it. 
And um, that's because humans are comfortable in their own reality. And uh, if there's no particular reason at that moment to shake them out of their reality, they'll stay in it, even if they're ultimately completely wrong. And I've always been stunned that when I explain where we're going, what we're doing, and why, almost everyone just says, that's interesting. And they continue doing what they're doing. And, and so, um, you know, I, I think it's pretty easy to do that, uh, you know, but what you need is a huge data set. So, you know, before AI and people's focus on data, you know, I've sort of been doing this mostly my whole life. I'm not a scientist. I'm not, a, let alone a computer scientist. And, you know, you, you can just hear what people are saying when somebody says something or you observe something that simply doesn't make sense. That's when you really go to work. The rest of it's just processing. I, it's tough for me to say, since I don't have domain uh, uh, knowledge in AI to know everything that could or might occur. Uh, I, I know um, sort of in my own case that, that most people don't see any of that. Right. Uh, I, I just assumed it was motivational. Uh, you know, um, but but it, it's also sort of, uh, it's hard wiring. What, what are you wired or programmed uh, to be finding uh, or looking for? It's, it's not what happens every day. That, that's not interesting, frankly. I mean, that's what people mostly do. I do a bunch of that too, uh, because, you know, that's what you do in normal life. But I, I've always been completely fascinated by the stuff that doesn't fit. Okay. Or the other way of thinking about it, it's, it's determining what, what people want w without them saying it. Uh, that, that, that's a, that's a, a different kind of pattern. You, you can see everything they're doing. There's a missing piece. They don't know it's missing. You think it's missing, given the other facts you know about them. And you you deliver that, and then that becomes, you know, sort of very easy uh, to 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 sell to them. Well, you 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 have to listen really intensely to understand uh, what people are saying, as well as what people are intending, because it's not necessarily the same thing, uh, and um, um, people mostly give themselves away, no matter how clever they think they are. Um, particularly if you have the full array of inputs. In other words, if you look at their face, you look at their eyes, which are the window on the soul, it's very difficult to, to conceal what, you, what you're thinking. Uh, you look at facial expressions and posture. You listen to their voice, which changes. Um, you know, when it's when you're you're talking about something you're comfortable with or not, are you speaking faster? Is the amplitude of what you're saying higher? Most people just give away what's really on their mind. Uh, you know, they're 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 not that clever. They're busy spending their time thinking about what they're in the process of saying, and and, and so if you just observe that, not in a hostile way. Uh, but just in an evocative way and just let them talk for a while, they'll more or less tell you almost completely uh, what they're thinking, even the stuff they don't want you to know. And, and once you know that, of course, it's sort of easy to play that kind of game uh, because th they've already told you everything you need to know. And, and, and so it's e easy to get to... Uh, a conclusion if there's meant to be one, an area of common interest, since you know almost exactly what's on their mind. Uh, and, and so that's an enormous advantage as opposed to just walking in and someplace and, and somebody telling you something and you believing what they're saying. Um, there, there are so many different levels of communication. <laughs> Sure. 
you know, if 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 you, if you know you're going to meet somebody, there are two two types of situations: chance meetings. And you know, the second is, you know, you're going to meet somebody. So let's take the easiest one, which is, you know, you're going to meet somebody. Uh, and um, you, you start trying to make pretend you're them. It's really easy. What's on their mind? Uh, what are they thinking about in their daily life? What are the big problems they're facing? So, so if they're, you know, to make it a really easy uh, example, um, you know, make pretend, you know, they're like president of the United States. Doesn't have to be this president. It could be any president. So you sort of know what's more or less on their mind because the press keeps reporting it. And and you see it on television. You hear it. Uh, people discuss it. So you know if you're going to be running into somebody in that kind of position, uh, you, you sort of know what they look like already. Uh, you know what they sound like. You You, you know... Uh, what their voice is like, and you know what they're focused on. And, and so if you're going to meet somebody like that, what, what, you should, you, what you should do is take the biggest unresolved issue that they're facing and, and come up with uh, a few interesting solutions that, that, that basically haven't been out there uh, or that you, you haven't heard anybody else uh, was thinking about. So just to give you an example, I was sort of in the early 1990s, and I was invited to something at the White House, which was a big deal for me because I was like, you know, a person from no place. And, and you know, I had met the president once before uh, because uh, it was President Bush because his son w was in my dormitory. So I, I had met him at Parents' Day. I mean, it's just <laughs> like the oddity of things. So, so I knew I was going to see him because, you know, that's where the invitation came from. And um, so, so there was something going on, and I just thought about, you know, two or three ways to approach that uh, that issue. And you know, at, at that point, I was uh, separated, and so I had brought a brought a date uh, to the White House, and uh, you know, and, and so, so I saw the president, and we sort of went over in a corner for about ten minutes and discussed whatever this issue was, and I. I, I later, you know, went back to my date. It was a little rude, but it was meant to be confidential conversation, and I barely knew her. Uh, and, um, you know, she said, what were you talking about all that time? And I said, well, you know, uh, there's something going on in the world, and I've thought about different ways of perhaps approaching that, and he was interested. Uh, and the answer is, of course he was interested. Why wouldn't he be interested? There didn't seem to be an easy outcome. and And so you know, conversations of that type, once somebody knows you're really thinking about what's good for them uh, and, and good for the situation, uh, it has nothing to do with with me. I mean, it's really about being in service, uh, you know, to, to, to the situation. That then people trust you and they'll tell you other things because they know your motives uh, are, are basically very pure. You're just trying to resolve a difficult situation and help somebody do it. So, so these types of things, um, you know, that's a planned situation. That's easy. There's sometimes you just come upon somebody and they start talking and, you know, that requires, you know, like different skills, you know, uh, you can ask them, what have you been working on lately? What are you thinking about? Uh, you, you, you can ask them, you know, has anything been particularly difficult? Any, any, you know, you can, Ask them, most people, if, if they trust you for some reason, um, they'll tell you. And, and then you have to instantly go to work on it. And, um, you know, that's, that's not as good as having some advanced planning. But, but you know, uh, almost everything going on is, is like out there. And, and people who are involved with interesting situations, um, they're, they're playing... In, 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 in the same ecosystem. They, they just have different roles uh, in, in the ecosystem. Uh, and, um, you know, you, you, you can do that with somebody who owns a pro football team uh, that loses all the time. We specialize in those in New York. And, and you know, you, you, you already have analyzed why they're losing, right? Inevitably, it's because they don't have a great quarterback 
they don't have a great coach and they don't have a great general manager who knows how to hire the best talent. Those are the three reasons why a team fails, right? Because there are salary caps. So every team pays the same amount of money for all their players. So it's got to be those three positions. So if you're talking with somebody like that, inevitably, even though it's not structured, you, 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 you'll, you'll, you'll know how their team's doing and you'll know pretty much why. And if you start asking questions about that, they're, they're typically very happy to talk about it because they haven't solved that problem. In some cases, they don't even know that's the problem. It's pretty easy to see it. So, you know, I, I do stuff like that, which I find is um, intuitive uh, as a process, uh, but, you know, le leads to really good results. I have a competitive advantage, which, <laughs> like which, is, which is, I don't think I'm so smart. Uh, so, That's so, good. That's... so, you know, it's not a problem for me. <laughs> well, I, I haven't changed much. Um, since? Since, since I was um, in my mid-teens, you know, I was, I was raised um, partly in the city and partly in the suburbs. And, um, and you know, whatever the values uh, I had uh, at that time, uh, those are still my values. Uh, I call them like middle class values. That's how I was raised, um, and um, I, I've I've never changed. Why would I? That, that's who I am, and and so the accoutrement of of um, you know the rest of your life has got to be put on the same you know like solid foundation of who you are, because if you start losing who you really are, who are you? Uh, so I, I've never had uh, the desire to be somebody else. I just do other things now that I, I wouldn't do as a, you know, sort of as a middle-class kid from Philadelphia. I mean, my life has morphed uh, on a certain level, but part of the strength uh, of having uh, integrity of uh, personality is is that you can remain in touch with um, with, with with everybody who's comes from that kind of background. And, and you know, even though I do some things that aren't like that, you know, in terms of people I'd meet or situations I'm in, I always look at it through the same lens. Uh, and that's very psychologically uh, comfortable uh, and doesn't require to me to make any real adjustments in my life. And I just keep plowing ahead. <laughs> I don't think about philanthropy the way you would expect me to, okay? I, I, I look at, you know, sort of uh, solving uh, big issues, addressing big issues, uh, starting new organizations to do it, uh, much like we do in our business. You know, we keep growing our business, not by taking the original thing and making it larger, but continually seeing new things and, and, and building those. And, and, you know, sort of marshalling financial resources, human resources, and, and in our case, because we're in the investment business, we find something new that looks like it's going to be terrific. And, and we do that, and it works out really well. All I do in what you would call philanthropy is, is look at other opportunities to help society. Um, and I end up starting something new, marshalling people, marshalling a lot of money. And, and then at the end of that kind of creative process, so somebody typically will ask me to write a check. I, I don't wake up and say, how can I like give large amounts of money away? I, I look at issues that are important uh, for people. Uh, in, in some cases, I, I do smaller things because it's important to a person. Uh, and, and, you know, I have, you know, sort of, I, I can relate to that person. There's some unfairness uh, that's happened to them. And so uh, I, in situations like that, I'd give money anonymously and help them out. And, you know, that, 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 that's, it's, it's, it's like a miniature version of addressing something really big. So, you know, at MIT, um, uh, I, I've done a big thing, uh, you know, helping to start this uh, new school of computing. 
and and I did that because you know I I saw that that you know there's sort of like a global race on uh, in AI, quantum, and other major technologies, and I I thought that um, that the, the U.S. could use more enhancement. Uh, from a competitive uh, perspective. And I also, because I get to China a lot and I travel around a lot compared to a regular person, um, you know, I, I can see the need to have control of, of these types of technologies so when they're introduced, we don't create a mess like we did with the internet uh, and, and with social media, uh, unintended consequence. Um, you know, that's creating all kinds of issues of freedom of speech and the functioning of liberal democracies. So with, with AI, it was pretty clear that there was enormous difference of views uh, around the world by the relatively few practitioners in the world who really knew what was going on. And uh, by accident, I knew a bunch of these people, uh, you know, who were like big famous people. Uh, and I could talk to them and say, why do you think this is a force for bad? And someone else, why do you feel this is a force for good? And and how do we move forward with the technology, but the same, by the same time make sure that whatever is potentially, you know, sort of on the bad side of this technology with, you know, for example, disruption of workforces and things like that, that could hap happen much faster than the Industrial Revolution. Uh, what do we do about that? And how do we keep that under control so that the really good things about these technologies, which will be great things, not good things, uh, are allowed to happen? So so to me, uh, you know, this, this was one of the great issues uh, facing society. The number of people who were aware of it were very small. I just accidentally got sucked into it. And, and as soon as I saw it, I went, oh my God, <laughs> this is mega. Yeah. Uh, uh, both on a competitive basis globally, uh, but, but also in terms of protecting uh, society and benefiting society. So, so, so that's how I got involved. And at the end, you know, sort of the right thing that we figured out was, you know, sort of double MIT's uh, computer science faculty and, and, and basically create the first AI-enabled uh, university in the world, uh, and you know, in effect, be an example, uh, a beacon to the rest of the research community around the world academically, and 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 create, you know, a much more um, robust uh, U.S. Uh, situation, competitive situation among the universities, uh, because if if MIT was going to raise a lot of money and double its faculty where you could bet that, you know, in, in a number of other universities were going to do the same thing at the end of it. It would be great for knowledge creation, you know, great for the United States, great for the world. Uh, and so I like to do things that I think are really positive uh, things that other people aren't acting on that I, I see for whatever the reason, first, it's just people I meet and what they say, and I can recognize when something really profound is about to happen or needs to, and I do it. And at the end of the at the end of the situation, somebody says, "Can, can you write a, a check to help us?" And then the answer is sure. I mean, because if I don't, the vision won't happen. But it's the vision of whatever I do that is compelling. Well, it's very difficult to predict the future when you're dealing with knowledge production and creativity. Um, you know, MIT has obviously um, some unique aspects, uh, you know, globally. And, you know, there's four big uh, sort of academic surveys. Um, I forget whether it was QS, uh, there's the Times, uh, in London, you know, the US News and whatever. And one of these recently, M MIT, was ranked number one in the world, yeah. right? So, so leave aside whether you're number three somewhere else, in the great sweep of humanity, this is pretty amazing, yeah. right? So, so you have a really um, remarkable aggregation of, of human talent uh, here. 
And um, where it goes, uh, it's hard to tell. You have to be a scientist to have the right feel. Um, but but what's what's important is you you have a critical mass uh, of people, and I, I think it, it breaks into two buckets. Uh, one is scientific advancement, uh, and and if the new college can uh, help, you know, sort of either uh, serve as a convening uh, force within the university, um, or, or or help sort of coordination and communication among people. Uh, th that's a good thing, um, absolute good thing. The second thing is is in the AI ethics area, uh, which uh, is 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 uh, in a way equally important because if if the science side creates blowback, uh, so so that science is 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 um, you know. Uh, uh, a bit crippled in terms of going forward because society's reaction to to knowledge advancement in this field becomes really hostile. Uh, th then you've sort of lost the game in, in terms of scientific progress and innovation. And and so the AI ethics piece is super important because you know uh, in a, in, a, in a perfect world, uh, MIT would would serve as a global convener. Uh, because what you need is, is you need the, the research universities, you, you need the companies uh, that are driving AI and quantum uh, work. Uh, you need governments who will ultimately be regulating certain elements of this. Uh, and you also need the media uh, to be knowledgeable and trained so, so, so we don't get um, sort of um, overreactions to to one situation, which then goes viral, uh, and it ends up shutting down avenues that are, are perfectly fine, you know, to to be walking down or running down that avenue, uh, but but if enough uh, uh, discordant uh, information, not even correct necessarily. Uh, you know, sort of gets, um, uh, you know, sort of, sort of gets pushed around society, then you can end up with a really hostile regulatory environment and other things. So you have four drivers that, that have to be um, sort of um, integrated. Uh, and, and so uh, if, if, if the new school of computing uh, can be really helpful in that regard, uh, then that's a real service uh, to science, and, and it's a service to MIT. So, so that's that's why I wanted to get involved for both areas. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I I, I think uh, MIT is perfectly uh, positioned uh, uh, to do that. I think that's a little above my pay grade because, um, you know, trying to control social media to make it do what you want to do sure. uh, appears to be beyond almost anybody's control. And and the technology is being used uh, to create what I call the tyranny of the minorities. Okay, a minority is defined as, you know, two or three people on a street corner. Doesn't matter what they look like. Yeah. Uh, doesn't matter where they came from. They're united um, by uh, that uh, one issue that they care about, and, and their job is to um, enforce their views uh, on the world. And you know, uh, in the political world, people just are manufacturing uh, truth, uh, and and they throw it all over, and it affects all of us. Uh, and um, you know, sometimes people are just hired. To, to do that. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, and you think it's one person, it's really, you know, just sort of a front, you know, for a particular point of view. Uh, and this has become uh, exceptionally disruptive uh, for uh, society and it's dangerous and it's undercutting, you know, the ability of liberal democracies to function. Uh, and I don't know how to get a grip 
on this. And I was really surprised um, when we, um, you know, it was up here for the announcement uh, last uh, uh, spring uh, of the College of Commu Computing, uh, and they had all these famous scientists, some of whom were involved with the invention mm -hmm. uh, uh, of the internet. And almost every one of them got up and said, I think I made a mistake. <laughs> uh, I, and as a non-scientist, I never thought I'd hear anyone say that. And, and what they said is, um, more or less, to make it simple, uh, we thought this would be really cool, uh, inventing the internet. We could connect everyone in the world. Uh, we can move knowledge around. It was instantaneous. It's a really amazing thing. He said, I don't know that there was anyone who ever thought about social media coming out of that and the actual consequences for people's lives. Uh, you know, so there's always some... Um, uh, some younger person, I just saw one of these yesterday, it's reported on the national news who killed himself when people use social media uh, to, to basically, you know, sort of ridicule him or something of that type. This is dead. Um, this is dangerous. Uh, and, um, you know, so, so I, I, I don't have a, a solution for that other than going forward you can end up with this type of outcome using AI. To make this kind of mistake twice is unforgivable. So, so interestingly, at least in the West uh, and, and parts of China, uh, people are quite sympathetic uh, to, to, you know, sort of the whole concept of AI ethics and what gets introduced when and, and cooperation within your own country within your own industry, uh, as well as globally, uh, to, to make sure that the technology is a force for good. Well, it's, it's sort of a wide question that you're, you're asking about. Uh, you know, China's a pretty unusual place. Uh, first, it's, it's huge. Uh, you know, you got, it's physically huge. It's got a billion three people. <laughs> and the, the character of the people isn't as well understood uh, in the United States. Um, uh, Chinese um, people are amazingly energetic. Uh, if, if you're one of a billion three people, one of the things you got to be focused on is how do you make your way, uh, you know, through a crowd uh, of, of a billion 2.99999 other people. Another uh, word for that is competitive. Yes, they they are individually highly energetic, highly focused, always looking for some opportunity uh, for themselves um, because they need to, uh, because there, there's an enormous amount of just literally people around. And, and so, you, you know, what I've found uh, is... Uh, they'll, they'll try and find a way to win uh, for themselves. Uh, and their country is complicated because it, it basically doesn't have the same kind of functional laws uh, that we do uh, in, in the United States, in the West. And, and um, the country is controlled really uh, through a, a web of relationships you have with other people. Uh, and the relationships that those other people have with other people. So it's an incredibly dynamic uh, uh, culture where if, if somebody knocks somebody up on the top who's three levels above you and is in effect protecting you, then, then you know, you're, you're like a, you know, sort of a floating molecule there, uh, you know, without tethering. Uh, except the one or two layers above you, but that's going to get affected. So it's a very dynamic system, and getting people to change uh, is not that easy, because if there aren't really functioning laws, it's only the relationships that everybody has. And, and so when you decide to make a major change, and you sign up for it, something is changing in your life there won't necessarily be all the same people on your team. Uh, and that's a very high risk enterprise. So when you're dealing with 
with China. It's important to know almost what everybody's relationship is with somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you suggest doing something differently, you, you, you line up these forces in the West, it's usually you talk to a person and they figure out what's good for them. Uh, it's a lot easier. And, and in that sense, in a funny way, it's easier to make change uh, in the West, just the opposite of what people think. Um, but, but once the Chinese system adjusts to something that's new, everybody's on the team. It's hard to change them, but once they're changed, they are incredibly focused in a way that it's hard for the West uh, to do in a more individualistic uh, culture. So, so there are all kinds of fascinating things. Um, uh, you know, um, I, uh, one thing that might interest, uh, you know, the people who are listening, we're more technologically based than some other group. Um, that was with the, one of the top people in uh, the government um, a few weeks ago, and he was telling me that that uh, every school child in um, uh, in China is is going to be uh, uh, taught computer science. Now imagine, hundred percent of these children. This is such a large number of human beings. Now that doesn't mean that every one of them will, will be good at computer science, but if it's sort of like in the West, if it's like math or English, you know, everybody's mm -hmm. going to take it. Yes. Not everybody's great at English. They don't write books. They don't write poetry. And not everybody's good at math. You know, somebody like myself, I sort of evolved to the third grade and I'm still doing flashcards. Uh, you know, I didn't make it further in math. Uh, but imagine everybody in their society is going to be involved with computer science. Yes. Well, we've got a complicated system because we have over 3,000 school districts around the country. Uh, China doesn't worry about that as a concept. They make a decision at the very top of the, the government that that's what they want to have happen, and that is what will happen. And uh, we're really handicapped. Uh, by this distributed, you know, power uh, in the education area. Although some people involved with that area will think it's uh, it's great, uh, but you know, you you would know better than I do uh, what percent of American children have computer science uh, uh, exposure. M my guess, no knowledge, uh, would be five percent or less, uh, and. If we're going to be going into a world where, where the other major economic uh, power, uh, sort of like ourselves, is, is, is got like 100% and we got five, and, and the whole computer science area uh, is the future, um, then, then we're purposely or accidentally actually handicapping ourselves and our system doesn't allow us uh, to adjust quickly. Uh, to that. So, you know, the, the issues like this, uh, I, I, I find fascinating. Uh, and, you know, if you're lucky enough to go to other countries, uh, which, which I do, um, and you learn what they're thinking, then it informs what, what we ought to be doing in, in, in the United States. I, I, I think, um, that you have to get the federal government in the game uh, in a big way. Uh, and that um, this leap forward uh, technologically, uh, which is gonna happen with or without us, uh, you know, really should be with us. Uh, and, and it's an opportunity in effect uh, for another moonshot uh, kind of mobilization uh, by uh, the United States, uh, I think. Uh, the appetite uh, actually is there uh, to do that. Uh, at the moment, uh, what's getting in the way is the kind of poisonous uh, politics we have. Uh, but, but if you go below uh, the lack of uh, cooperation, which 
is is almost def the defining element of American democracy right now in the Congress. If you talk to individual members, they get it and they would like to do something. Another part of the issue is we're running huge deficits. We're running trillion dollar plus deficits. So how much money do you need for this um, initiative? Where does it come from? Who's prepared to stand up for it? Uh, because if it, if it involves taking away resources from another area, uh, our political system is, is not real flexible uh, to do that. Uh, if you're creating um, th th this kind of initiative, um, which we need, where does the money come from? Uh, and, and trying to get money when you've got trillion dollar deficits, in, in a way, it could be easy. What's the difference of a trillion and a trillion a little more? Uh, but, but, you know, it's, it's hard with the mechanisms uh, of Congress. But what, what's, what's really important is uh, th th this is not an issue uh, that is unknown. And it's viewed as a very important issue. Uh, and there's almost no one in the Congress, when you sit down and explain what's going on, who doesn't say, we, we've got to do something. <music> It's very interesting. Um, so uh, w when I was young, uh, before there was a moonshot, uh, we had a president uh, named John F. Kennedy uh, from Massachusetts here. And in his inaugural address as president, uh, he asked not what your country can do for you, uh, but what you can do for your country. Now, we, we had a generation of people, my age, basically people, who grew up uh, with that credo. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes you don't need to innovate. Uh, you can go back to basic principles. And that's a good basic principle. Uh, what, what, can, what can we do? Um, you know, Americans have GDP per capita of around $60,000. Uh, you know, not every, it's not equally distributed but it's big. Uh, and, you know, um, people have, I think, a an obligation uh, to help their country. And I do that. And yeah, apparently I take some grief for pe from some people, you know, who, who, who um, project on me things I don't even vaguely believe. Uh, but, but I'm like quite simple. Uh, you know, I tried to help the previous president, uh, President Obama. He was a good guy, uh, and he was a different party. And I tried to help President Bush, and he's a different party. And you know, uh, I, 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 I sort of don't care that much uh, about what the parties are. I care about, even though I'm a big donor for the Republicans, but it's, it's what motivates me is. What are the problems we're facing? And can I help people get to, you know, sort of a good outcome that, that'll stand any test? Uh, but we live in a world now where, you know, sort of the filters uh, and, and the hostility is, is so unbelievable. Uh, you know, in the 1960s, when I went to school uh, in the university, I went to Yale, we had like, like so much stuff going on. Uh, we had a war called the Vietnam War. We had, you know, sort of black power starting, and and uh, you know we had a sexual revolution with the birth control pill, uh, and um, you know um, there was one other major thing going on, and right the drug revolution there hasn't been a generation that had more stuff going on in a four-year period than my uh, era. Yet, there wasn't this kind of instant hostility if you believed something different. Everybody lived together and, and you know, respected uh, the other person. And, and I think that 
you know, this type of change needs to happen. And it's got to happen uh, from the leadership of, of our major institutions. And I, I don't think that, that leaders can be bullied uh, by people who are against, you know, sort of the classical version of free speech and letting open expression and yes. inquiry. That's what universities are for, uh, among other things, uh, Socratic methods. And uh, so, so I, I have, um, uh, in, in, in the midst of this, like, onslaught uh, of oddness, uh, I, I, I believe in still the basic principles, and we're going to have to find a way to get back to that. And that, that doesn't start with the people, uh, you know, sort of in the middle to the bottom who are using, you know, these kinds of screens to, to shout people down and, and create an uncooperative environment. It's got to be done uh, at the top with core principles that are articulated uh, and uh, ironically, um, if people don't sign on to these kind of core cr principles where people are equal and, and you know, speech can be heard and, you know, you don't have these enormous shout down biases subtly or, or out loud, then they don't belong at those institutions. They're, they're violating the core principles. And, and um, you know, that, that's how you end up making change. Uh, and but you have to have courageous people uh, who are willing to lay that out for the benefit of not just their institutions, but for society uh, as a whole. So I, I, I believe that will happen, um, but it needs the commitment uh, of, of, of senior people to make it happen. <music> I'd say it's a rough ride, uh, and you have to be psychologically prepared for things going wrong with frequency. You have to be prepared uh, to be put in situations where you're being asked to solve problems you didn't even know those problems existed. You know, for example, renting space. It's, it's not really a problem unless you've never done it. You have no idea what a lease looks like, right? You don't even know the relevant rent and, you know, in a market. So everything is new. Everything has to be learned. What, what you realize is that it's good to have other people with you who've had some experience in areas where you don't know what you're doing. Unfortunately, uh, an entrepreneur starting doesn't know much of anything. So everything is, is something new. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, I think it's important not to be alone uh, because it's sort of overwhelming uh, and you need somebody to talk to uh, other than uh, a spouse or a loved one uh, because even they get bored with your problems. Uh, and, and so, you know, getting a group, you know, if you look at Alibaba, uh, you know, Jack Ma was telling me they went, they, they basically were like at financial death's door at least twice. Uh, and, you know, the fact that there, it wasn't just Jack, I mean, people think it is because of, you know, he became the, you know, the sort of public face and the driver, uh, but, but a group of people uh, who can give advice, share situations to talk about. Uh, that's really important. And that's not just referring to the small details like renting space. No. It's also the psychological yes. burden. Yeah, and you know, because most entrepreneurs at some point question what they're doing because it's not going so well, or they're screwing it up and they don't know how to unscrew it up uh, because we're all learning. Uh, and it's hard to be learning you know, when there are like 25 variables going on, if you, you know, if you're missing four big ones, you can really make a mess. Uh, and, and so the ability to, to in effect, have either an outsider uh, who's really smart that you can rely on for certain type of things, uh, or other people who are working with you on a daily basis. Um, it's, most people who haven't had experience 
uh, believe in the myth of the one person, one great person, you know, makes outcomes, uh, creates outcomes that are positive. Most of us, it's not like that. If, if you look back over a lot of the big successful tech uh, companies, it, it's not typically one person. It, you know, it's, and, and you will know these stories better than I do, because uh, it's your world, not mine. But even I know that almost every one of them had two people. I mean, if you look at Google, you know, that, that's what they had. And, and, and that was the same at Microsoft at the beginning. And, you know, um, it was the same at Apple. It, you know, people have different skills and, and they need to play off of uh, other people. So, so um, you know, the, the advice that, that, that I would give you is make sure you understand that so you don't head off in some direction as a lone wolf uh, and find that either you can't invent all the solutions um, or you make bad decisions on certain types of things. This is a team sport. Entrepreneur means you're alone, in effect, and that's the myth, uh, but it's mostly a myth. Well, ultimately, all journeys are alone. Um, it's great to have support. Um, and, you know, um, when you, 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 you go forward and say, your job is to make something work, and that's your number one priority, um, and, and you're going to work at it to make it work, you know, it's like superhuman effort. People don't um, become successful as part-time workers. It doesn't work that way. Uh, and if you're prepared to make that 100 to 120 percent uh, effort, you're, you're going you're gonna to need support, and and you're going to have to have people involved with your life who understand that that's really part of your life. Uh, sometimes you you're involved with somebody and you know they don't really understand that, and that's a source of you know sort of conflict and difficulty. But if, you, if you're involved with the right people, uh, you know, whether it's a sort of dating relationship or, um, you know, sort of, a, you know, spousal relationship, um, you know, you, you have to involve them uh, in your life, uh, but not burden them mm. with, with every, you know, sort of minor triumph or mistake. They, they actually get bored with it after a while and and so you have to set up different types of ecosystems you, you have your home life you have your love life uh, you have children and and that's like the enduring part of what you do and then on the other side you you've got the you know sort of unpredictable nature uh of um of 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 this type of work what, what I say to people at my firm who were younger, usually, um, well, everybody's younger, but, but um, you know, people who are of an age where, where, where you know, they, they're just having their first child, uh, or maybe they have two children, that it's important um, to, to make sure they go away uh, with their spouse uh, uh, at least once every two months just some lovely place where there are no children, no issues, uh, sometimes once a month if, if they're, you know, sort of energetic and clever. Uh, and that... Um, Escape the craziness of it all. Yeah, and, all. And, and reaffirm uh, your, your values as a couple. Uh, and you have to have fun. If you don't have fun with the person you're with uh, and all you're doing is dealing with issues... Then, then that gets pretty old. And, and so you have to protect the fun element uh, of your life together. And the way to do that isn't by hanging around the house and, and dealing with, you know, sort of more problems. It, you have to get away and, and reinforce and reinvigorate uh, your relationship. And whenever I tell one of our younger people about that, they sort of look at me and they're 
It's like the scales are falling off of their eyes and they're saying, geez, you know, I hadn't thought about that. You know, I'm so enmeshed in all these things, but that's a great idea. And that's something as an entrepreneur, you, you also have to do. Uh, you, you just can't let relationships slip because you're half overwhelmed. This is the Lex Free Podcast.